Once again, we welcome you back to Moving Forward with Young Voices. Very happy to welcome Isaac Willauer back to the program. Isaac, we always have, uh, I think, uh, really thought-provoking conversations, and this is going to oh, be yeah. no exception. Um, first of all, for the sake of those meeting you for the first time, take a moment, tell us a little bit about who you are. For sure, yeah. So I'm an award-winning journalist. My current focus is on race, culture, American conservatism. My my day job, I'm a corporate analyst at Proxy Analyst Firm Boyer Research in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We work with financial advisors and red state fiduciaries to combat ESG and a variety of different access portfolios. Okay, so I'm looking at an article of yours about uh, a plea from a Gen Z social media addict. And and I'll tell you, <laughs> right now there are thousands of people in Texas who are without power because of Hurricane Beryl. Yep. And I'm just wondering how many of them are absolutely losing their minds because they can't check their phones, you know, with the, with the power yeah, off. You know, it's it's a real problem. You know, like I, I have I, I so one of the things I talk about in the article is that this is this completely conscious on my on my part. I'm fully aware that I have a problem. Right. Because it's getting to the point where I'll leave I'll leave my phone like in the glove compartment of my car when I go into some social event. And one, I will feel the phone in my pocket. It's not there. I can one hundred my brain one hundred percent believes it's there. And two, I've had moments where my hands will start shaking because I'm so used to having it like it's right here. Literally, it's right here. It's like Linus's security blanket, right? And when it's not there, my brain is just immediately goes into this bizarre addict like response. And after a couple couple years of this, I'm I'm being told this is probably an issue. And I'm thinking with the current debates over how useful social media is for young people and all this kind of stuff, maybe this is something I need to think about and opine more about. So, you know, as far as addictions go, this is not an obvious one. I mean, someone who's addicted to heroin, you know, they seem to be in much more dire straits, but this is no less well, real is, of an kind addiction. Of is obvious, though. That's the weird thing. It kind of is obvious. It's obvious in the sense of you can see that it happens, right? The dependency is very obvious, right? Well, you, you can go to the streets of any city right now and you can look at the street corners and everyone's just sitting there on their phones, right? If there, if you went to every street corner and there was someone sitting there shooting up heroin, like that would be um, a, a matter that you might think about for the rest of the day, right? <laughs> so in, in terms of obviousness, it's not as obviously bad as shooting up heroin, I guess I'd say. But in terms of it's so obviously impactful, 100% it is. Yeah. No, that's, is no, that's a good point. Now. Fair, fairly taken. And, and the thing is, it's it's an acceptable addiction. Nobody thinks yeah. twice about, uh, you know, everybody sitting around the dinner table with their face yeah. in, in, well, in the screen of their phone. It's an acceptable addiction, and it is a... It is an addiction for which there are positive um, benefits, right? And this is one of the things that I talk about in the piece. Like, if we're gonna if we're gonna talk about social media accurately, especially in terms of its impact on Generation Z, right? We need to talk about the fact that we just all came out of a pandemic where, for a solid couple of months, depending on which state you lived in, like many months, this was the primary means of communication between you and the, and the outside world and your friends in the rest of the world and other states. Like, this is this was just a built-in reality of our lives and so it perhaps it's no surprise that a bunch of us have all these problems but if we're going to talk about how we got there we also need to acknowledge the fact that there have been some real benefits in terms of the connection in the online communities that have been open to us through these through these media i like that you're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. so i'm going to ask you where do we strike that balance i mean what you described waking up in the morning checking that phone first thing yep i'm there fully addicted yeah how can oh, we yeah, how can we too. how can we find a, a a happy medium where this is not what's driving us but at the same time we're not losing the good stuff yeah well, this is the interesting thing right so when it, when it comes to kids and this is a point i make in the article like there's this weird thing where when you ban kids from doing stuff they don't just stop doing it they actually want to do it more and if you don't and anyone who's who's doubtful on this point i challenge you to go meet any child i think in terms of the actual rational basis for how we deal with smartphone addiction like i don't think like vivek murphy who's the u.s surgeon general is talking about this warning label on social media platform like we have existing precedent for how this has worked in the past like it really did really well when the pmrc was trying to put explicit content labels on music back in the 1980s and it totally curbed the spread of extreme music and there's none of it in america today <laughs> because that's completely what happened touche right so like does this work is this does this really work like, is this doing anything except assuaging parents' feelings and giving them some kind of panacea that in the best possible case scenario is completely ineffective and in the worst case scenario just provides a panacea that you can use to cover up your bad parenting and inability to help your kids make healthy choices? I don't think so. 
Talk to me about Generation Z, too, because this it's Generation weird, Z is, is especially affected by this. Why is that? Yeah, well, there's this great quote from this the fantastic new book that I'm making my way through right now, The Anxious Generation by Jonathan Haidt. Um, he has this quote, Gen Z became the first generation in history to go through puberty with a portal in their pockets. It called them away from the people nearby and into an alternative an alternative universe that was exciting, addictive, and unstable, wow. right? Yeah, that's that's Gen Z. That's Gen Z in a nutshell, right? We went through lives with this being the barrier between us and the rest of the world. And is that totally healthy? No. And it's very clear that, that whether there's a lot of different angles you could take, whether, whether you want to talk about the neurochemistry behind it or you just want to talk about the broad-based social effects of a bunch of people who now think that speech is violence and that microaggressions matter and are fed into this dumb college campus culture, right? There are lots of there are lots of real downsides to that. I think social media has fed into that, but also like social media opened up the world to us. It let us socialize. It let us find communities that we otherwise would not have had. Let us explore shared interests that we otherwise wouldn't have had. I think we tend to glorify the pre technological age as this perfect as this perfect age where everyone was completely well adjusted. And no one did any weird things, and it's like, well, next time you're stranded in like a Detroit back alley and you either need an Uber or medical attention, then you can take your dial-up rotor phone, and you can go and have a wonderful time in this magical pre-technological world. I will be there on my iPhone, and I probably won't be in that Detroit back alley. So, like, maybe let's count our blessings a little bit. No, I I, I hear you. It's 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 that there's so much benefit, though, that we don't really see the negative unless somebody points yeah. it out. And I don't like the idea that, uh, yep, I'm addicted. But as I read your article, I realized, no, I'm showing every sign of addiction to social media and to my devices that uh, that would fit. Yeah, well, it's a misprioritization, right? You talk, We talk about, like, there's this current debate about workaholism, right? Work is not bad, right? Work is not a fundamental bad. Social media is also not a fundamental bad. There's a correct prioritization of things in our lives. If you view work, we a workaholism, to the extent that it's real, is just a misprioritization and a misunderstanding of work fundamentally is and is meant to do in the same way that social media addiction is a bastardization of what we think social media is supposed to do. It's supposed to be a tool, not a not a, a crutch by which to navigate life. So I think it's that the solution to workaholism is not to become unemployed, right, and depend on government handouts. In the same way that this, the cure to social media addiction is not to throw your phone in the river and go for a walk, although, I mean, if that's what you got to do, <laughs> I, go nuts, but... I, I think there's it's there are there are teleological questions at the root of this in terms of how we think about social media, what it does for us, and what we use it for, and I think answering those questions wisely takes more nuance than just stop getting on Twitter. Although it probably does include a fair bit of that too. Well, and it seems like there are some other addictions that that can come along with just the addiction to the dopamine hit that comes from oh somebody liked oh, yeah, what I posted. Yeah. I I see people fully addicted to anger, for instance. Yeah. And tw- funny you mentioned Twitter, or internet porn, right? Yeah, like like without the iPhone, there's if you got rid of everyone's iPhone, there'd be a lot less addiction to internet porn. That is true. Very true. But like there would also be a bunch of people stuck in Detroit back alleys, not able to get medical care or dial nine one one for things that they need. So I, I think I think the the analogy you made before is the right one. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, because one, it's unwise, and two, it's really not pro life to do. So nuances is, is absolutely necessary. So where where can people find this article? I, I think it's worth their yeah. time. Yeah, well, I, I I'm on Twitter, I X, whatever you want to call it, and because of what I talked about in the article, I post on there quite regularly. So I S A A C W I L L O U R, and then you can find my Substack in there. It's all there. okay. The Great work, as always. Again, we're talking with Thanks, Isaac Ryan. Willauer. He is a Young Voices contributor, an award-winning journalist, and a corporate analyst at Boyer Research. And um, anything else on the horizon as far as uh, what, what we might be talking about in the days ahead? Uh, I'm going to go look at my screen monitor app and go on a walk in keeping <laughs> with the spirit of this article. But who knows? Who knows what's coming next? God only knows. All right. Well, I appreciate you keeping your uh, finger on the pulse of what's happening there. Um, look forward Thanks, to our Brian. next conversation. We'll talk to you yeah, soon. Yeah, man. Take care. Bye. Welcome back to Moving Forward with Young Voices. We are happy to welcome Lexi Bakuzi back to the program. She is a Young Voices contributor and also a policy analyst at the Manhattan Institute. I understand that's that's a fairly recent development, right? 
It is. I just graduated from um, Penn in May of 2024, which is kind of crazy to say. And so I've been working at MI since then, and it's been um, a great role. I had been a collegiate associate there two summers ago, so I have a really good relationship with the team. And I've been working primarily on higher ed issues. Um, but as you'll see with this City Journal piece, um, touching a little bit of, of everything, particularly uh, religion, sociocultural issues, and the law as well, which are my, my other interests. So let me first say congratulations. That's uh, that's quite a feather in your cap. And next, I want to tell you what an interesting article you have here in City Journal. Go back to church. The subtitle here, contrary to the left's narrative, religion isn't polarizing it. The lack of it is very intriguing because you're right. That There is a strong narrative out there that says, well, you know, the more we can get religion out of society, the better things are going to be. It, it right. do, doesn't seem to be panning out. Set the stage for us. Um, when, when we talk about uh, how how religion is being viewed as a polarizing force, where does that viewpoint originate? Can we pinpoint a place in time where suddenly it, it was not a positive in American society? Well, I don't know if it's quite, um, quite you know, you know, a place in time, Brian, but more so sort of a trend that has come and gone with different periods. I think, you know, the 1980s showed um, a real, you know, third, fourth grade awakening, whatever you want to call it at that point, where there was a revival of um, religion in the public sector as not necessarily through the arm of government. I think that's a misunderstanding of people who think about the rights relationship with religion or people who believe religion has a role in liberal society's relationship with it. But instead, the idea that religion has a place and contribute something. Um, the catalyst actually for writing this piece, although it's something that I think about sort of concurrently, was the, um, there was a, a, a woman who was um, presenting herself as sort of a gotcha reporter, undercover reporter, but I think would more accurately really be described as a left-wing activist who had um, tried to sort of goat um, Justice Alito into saying that his um, Catholic faith was going to be sort of directing his um, his jurisprudence in his role as a Supreme Court justice. Um, and uh, to no one's surprise, Justice Alito didn't really give her that much, although the uh, firestorm on Twitter would lead you to believe otherwise. But if you actually listen to the tape recordings, there isn't much there. Um, but it is interesting, and, and sort of the relationship with... Um, organized religion, Catholicism in particular, I think is a great example of sort of where sentiments have gone and how far the Overton window has shifted. But in truth, the anti-Catholic sentiment in the United States goes goes much, much deeper than that. I mean, it is it is in the root of the founding. And I think that one of the beauties, it was actually one of the one of the key reasons why the separation of church and state, or rather um, the, fir the First Amendment's um, caveats on religion were a part of this, was to ensure protections for practicing Catholics. Um, and I think it's interesting to see how that has been twisted into, you know, church has no place in our society and religious people are evil and they are anti um, sort of public actors or anti social actors rather than sort of the opposite, which being the protection of various sort of religious um, enterprises and activities was a key social feature of the founding and of the American experiment. Well said. I mean, we've, we've reached an inversion where, and I'm sorry, these are, these are very polarizing examples, but the same people who would cheer for a nearly naked person dancing for children would be the right. first ones to go apocalyptic uh, for someone, especially someone in, a, in a, an elected position or position of authority, expressing some kind of religious sentiment publicly. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, it's true. I think if this goes this goes back to um, uh, Senator Dianne Feinstein's line during um, uh, Amy Coney Barrett's nomination to the uh, Court of Appeals, um, where she says the dogma lives loudly within you. I mean, even the idea of being someone who is a practicing, um, you know, member of a you know religious group or sect has now become controversial. There were similar sentiments expressed when um, Speaker Mike Johnson um, got his speakership and some disgusting things that ran in left wing media about him and his family. And I think it is somewhat absurd to see how far the like worshiping of, of, you know, secular society has gone so much so that even just the existence of religious people is demonized. Um, and, and the data seems to show the exact opposite, actually, that religious people are not these, you know, demonizing, polarizing or um, antisocial people, but instead that they seem to be, you know, the most um, productive and communitarian in our society. I love that you mentioned uh, Harrison Budker in in your article as well. Mm -hmm. um, he was on a lot of people's radar screens here just a couple of months ago with his commencement address at uh, Benedictine College. And right. everything he said, I'll grant you, you know, some people might say, well, I don't know if I really agree with that. But 
I think it was well within the the mainstream as far as uh, there was nothing there that was like so shockingly out of left field that, you know, people would be wondering where he came up with it. What he was talking about was something that even 20 years ago, maybe 40 years ago, people would say, oh, well, that's that's really kind of the norm. Nobody would have batted an eye. Yeah, and I think the thing that's super frustrating about a lot of this is also the way, Brian, you know, this stuff is taken out of context. I had many a conversation with my female friends about the Butker um, speech, with which, you know, like, as all practicing Catholics, we kind of defer sometimes on the margins about some of these things. So I didn't agree with every word of it, but I, they certainly were misunderstanding what the sentiments of what he was saying was. And I think the idea that things now with the internet internet can spiral so far out of control that you are no longer able to give a speech to an audience in which it's intended, but rather it becomes this large political platform about every single, you know, that every single woman on the internet has to consume. Um, and as I explained to many of my girlfriends, the, the speech wasn't intended for them, right? The speech was intended for, you know, traditional practicing Catholics at this small, um, you know, the small college who largely probably agreed with what Bucker had to say, but not to mention the words that he was using had specific meaning meaning likely in the Catholic uh, faith, right? And so if you don't understand what those things mean, they can easily be taken out of context. And I think it really, the left is sort of using this as a tool to stoke this fire against religious people which is something, I mean, it was something that there was internal Democratic fighting during the Kennedy nomination in 1960. So this really isn't anything new for the Democratic Party, but I think um, there's just been an intense revival of it um, in a way that I think is is really concerning because you're stripping people of one of the only, and that's why the article ended up being titled Go Back to Church, one of the only um, sort of aspects in which they can be exposed to different viewpoints, different types of people, socioeconomic diversity, racial diversity, diversity as um, regarding like the pews of a Catholic church um, and they come out more hopeful, more tolerant, all those things. So it, it's interesting too. the reaction on the left to, to Butker's remarks was again, people that you mentioned weren't even, this, the speech wasn't even intended for them, but uh, people were petitioning right. the NFL. You need to get rid of this guy. You need to drop him. And it was kind of reassuring to see his teammates and his coach stand up for him and say, there's nothing wrong with him. <laughs> you know, he's just expressing an opinion. And at least I'm glad some people are able to make that distinction. But boy, it seems like if you cross that line, um, you know, the cancel culture mob is is waiting, stones in hand. Yeah, and I think, and the the thing that is so is so sad to me about this is it's just, like I said, it's really just such a reverse narrative. I mean, um, I encourage people to look up um, Ryan Burge, who is a political scientist, um, a statistician, and a Baptist pastor. Um, I believe he's a Baptist pastor, but he's definitely a pastor. Um, and he does a lot of research on sort of this de-churching phenomenon. So even religious people aren't going to services as much as they are, as they used to be. And um, it really appears as though church synagogues, you know, mosques, whatever, houses of worship, really proved as a tool for depolarization um, and proved as a tool to sort of improve um, uh, community support for families and for individuals. And I think, um, as Jonathan Haidt writes, and I explain a little bit further in the piece, like when, um, you know, anti-socialism so hyper anxiety, hyper polarization, hyper polarization, hyper alienation, um, increasing rates of depression as a result of phone use, et cetera, become so much more and more amplified. The only reason why you would not want people to go to church, and I have a line in the piece where I say this, is if you desire to have an anxious, antisocial, and polarized population, which behooves um, politicians and particularly those on the left who I think are capitalizing on this. Um, but it's, it is really concerning to me, Brian, and, and I hope people start to see both the benefits of faith in their own lives as well as, you know, the, the statistical and sociological um, benefits as well. Agreed. Uh, one final thought here, and that is if people would take the time to actually look for the goodness around them, they'd be shocked at how much there really is. Anyway, on that it's note, so true. <laughs> Lexi, where can people follow you on social media? Where can they follow your work? Um, so you can follow me on Twitter, which is at Lexi um, Bacuzzi, which is just my name spelled out. And then you can also check out my Substack, which is linked there, which is called On the Record, where I post all of my articles and sometimes other passing thoughts as they come. Um, so if you'd like more of me on the record, you can get it there. Thank you. Welcome back to Moving Forward with Young Voices. It's segment three of today's show, and I'm happy to welcome back to the program Connor Vasile. Connor is uh, the author 
well, I, we'll get to we'll get to his book here in just a moment. He's a Young Voices contributor. There there are some other hats he wears. We're going to have to have him talk about that in a moment. But uh, we have a very timely book to discuss, and that is I'm Joe Biden in his own words. Connor, how are you today? Hi, Brian. Thanks for having me again. It's great. So uh, before we talk about your book, which I think couldn't be more timely (laughs) than right now, let's talk first a little bit about you and about your background. Of course, you're a Young Voices contributor. What else do you do? Thank you. Yes, I'm a a writer. I'm an author. I do a little acting on the side uh, whenever I have some free time. And um, right now I'm currently a law student. So, you know, definitely a few hats to juggle. Well, let's uh, let's talk about your book. Uh, I'm Joe Biden in his own words. Uh, Biden's been getting a lot of attention lately. I don't know if you've noticed this, but uh, I've I've long believed that if you really want to get a feel for who a person is, you don't look at what other people are saying about him. You actually see what are they saying themselves. Tell me about your book and and how you went about uh, putting that together. Well, most definitely, as we see, Brian, is that all the recent PR we have around uh, President Joe Biden is because he is very eloquent. He's very level headed. He is the most capable and competent president we have ever or will ever have. So I'm sorry. I my, about- my sarcasm detector is smoking and putting out sparks. Give me just a second. I got to set it outside. Now, please continue. <laughs> I have no idea what you mean. I, I think he's, he's wonderful. Obviously, I'm uh, being sarcastic. But uh, I wanted to write I'm Joe Biden to basically commemorate or memor- uh, memorialize in a, in a better uh, term all of Joe Biden's um, – very unique moments throughout his uh, decades working in politics as a senator, uh, vice president, and now currently as the uh, president of the United States. So I'm Joe Biden is a mix between a quote book and uh, a bit of commentary to uh, to shine a light on our president, what he has been saying and doing throughout the decades, and why he's our best pick to save democracy this year. There goes my sarcasm detector again. <laughs> Actually, no, I think this I, – I really believe that uh, – that, uh, satire and i don't know if this isn't so much satire as just well maybe it is satire um you know you're using his own words though to illustrate something that um for some reason the the press in this country has only caught on to within the last say 10 days or so and that is hey you know something's not quite right uh with with the president uh, i'd love to get your reaction to the first of all the disastrous debate performance a week ago thursday or two weeks ago thursday and then um the, the press's reaction to that, because there, there's a lot of unfeigning surprise, like, well, we never saw this coming. How did he hide this from us? Definitely. I mean, uh, when it comes down to brass tacks, satire naturally implies some sort of embellishment or exaggeration. But in the case of the book, I'm Joe Biden, all I'm doing is using his own words straight from the horse's mouth. So everything that's written in that book, sans the commentary, comes from uh, the man himself. So it's... Kind of jarring, I would assume, for the people in the media and many Americans who may not be so in tune with politics to see a world leader, arguably the most important world leader, uh, just utterly fail on the debate stage or in pressers, interviews, etc. Because this man, uh, you know, whichever way someone may feel about him, he is just not mentally capable of doing the job, as we've seen with uh, his most recent interview with, with the ABC, George Stephanopoulos. And this is not a matter of just partisan, you know, sniping at the man. Um, I, most of the people I've heard express concern about uh, the president's obvious cognitive decline have been expressing it out of a sense of, isn't this elder abuse to put him out there like that and, you know, to, to prop him up and, and, you know, now you walk to your podium and you shake this person's hand. And, you know, I mean, it, it, it's, it seems like he, he is out of his element and yet there, there's this effort to maintain that, oh, no, no. He's still the figurehead. He's in charge, and and it's it's all falling apart like a soup sandwich now. I could use a sandwich right now, but that's besides the point. <laughs> uh, no, I think that um, in ter- in terms of his performance, right, you, we're at this point where people have to come to face with reality. I actually made a, a reel that I shared on Twitter uh, the other day, where I basically uh, related to a sort of weekend at Bernie scenario. Right. We have this media, the press, legacy media. Some of them are actually actively calling for the Biden campaign to use, say, AI now for for all of his speeches and his texts and uh, all of his appearances, which is just ridiculous. Right. If someone 
right of center even entertains even jokingly that idea, it would be, you know, the end of the world as we know it. But since it's Biden and he has a little D next to his name, it's totally all right. Um, but as we just saw the other day, Brian, we all saw that letter that he sent out uh, to uh, congressional Democrats saying, hey, listen, I am running. I'm the presumptive nominee. I will be your Democratic nominee for president. And too bad. And to that, I just have to say, great. <laughs> let's let's keep on with that, you know. Well, it seems like there's a power struggle taking place within the Democratic Party. I've actually heard the term, and I'm not so sure I disagree with it, that is it possible that uh, Biden, perhaps with Jill and Hunter, has uh, taken the White House hostage, you know, from the Democratic Party? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I think that uh, they've had this sort of issue for quite a while now, and only now it's uh, coming to light. Uh, whether, you know, how much Jill Biden is uh, pulling the strings or the Sun Hunter or whomever else is up to interpretation. However, what we see here is a, a full on push from congressional Democrats and the Biden campaign, the Biden family, et cetera, to just prop up this man, regardless of um, any consequences or mental health uh, concerns or physical health concerns. The man's an octogenarian. Uh, I don't even know how. You know, he can stand on his, on his own two feet. That was actually some commentary on that past debate performance. He did so good. Good job, Joe. You answered all the questions. Like, come on. But, you know, that's the standard we have now in our system of politics. And unfortunately, it's not going to get better until we actually address the issue of meritocracy in this country. And I, I love that uh, you, you're basing this in, look, we need to return to reality. I think there's been way too much pretending on any number of fronts. But uh, but this is a rather important one. I mean, this after all, this is the person who we trust with uh, the nuclear football. You know, this is the one we trust as the commander in chief to make those decisions that are, are extremely, uh, you know, heavy decisions. And yet it's it's becoming clear, alarmingly clear that uh, he's, he's probably not the one doing all the day to day decision making. Now what? Yeah. I mean, a little tangent, but we saw the other day he's stating that he won't take any uh, any meetings or any interviews after, what was it, 4 p.m. or something like that? He has yeah. to be in bed by 8. It's like, that's, that's the leader of the free world, air quotes. But uh, as this progresses, I actually think, Brian, that the, the conversation, the fear of, let's say, who's going to be the, the presumptive nominee – it's actually shifting away from that and more towards, okay, what about uh, voter integrity, election laws? Because we are, we're seeing that uh, legislation going through um, Congress right now, the SAVE Act, correct? And Biden administration and his team unequivocally is opposed to it. They're arguing, oh, it's already illegal uh, to vote in a federal election if you're not a citizen, so this is superfluous. Um, so we're going to definitely see some issues with that. I would say in the coming months, if people do not get their stuff together. The Babylon Bee had, I think, the best headline on that earlier today, and that was people who absolutely would not cheat worried about new law that would prevent <laughs> cheating in an election. It's like, yep, there seems to be a lot of yeah. protesting there. Um, we're, we're down to about one minute left. Let's give some information for people who want to check out your book. And by the way, I have a copy of it, and it is excellent. Where can they find it? Thank you, sir. I'm glad you like it. Uh, if they're interested, they can find me on Twitter at Connor underscore Vasile. He is in Victor. My books are available on Amazon, both The State Knows Best and I'm Joe Biden right there on Amazon. OK, it's look, this is this is a lighthearted book. I don't want people to think, oh, my goodness, he's going to get in there and just rip that poor president to shreds. But uh, when you use Biden's own words, I mean, he does a pretty good job of um, basically showing, you know, what cards he's holding and uh Looks, looks like a lot of jokers, at least from, from my vantage point right now. Anyway, Connor, thank you so much. Yep. Thanks for having me. All right, we will uh, take a very quick break. When we come back, we'll finish up today's show with uh, Donald Kimball. Stay with us. Welcome back to Moving Forward with Young Voices. This is our fourth and final segment today. Happy to welcome Donald Kimball back to the program. Donald, uh, for those meeting you for the first time, let's take a moment and introduce you to them properly. Tell us about who you are and what you do. 
course. Thanks for having me back. My name is Donald Kimball. I'm happy to be a Young Voices contributor. I've also done some uh, work with America's Future, and I am the communications manager at Washington Policy Center, which is a state-based think tank that promotes free market common sense solutions. All right, let's let's talk about free speech laws. And you point out in this article uh, that Texas and Florida recently have passed laws banning viewpoint suppression on social media. Now, on the surface, that sounds like a really good idea. Of course, we're not going to let social media ban, you know, certain viewpoints. But there is a flip side to this that I think a lot of people might not consider at first blush. What is that flip side? Yeah. So to, to start out, I'm very sympathetic with the arguments that were made to initially pass these laws, right? When we saw the ridiculous amounts of suppression of voices on social media sites, particularly in 2020, when there was, you know, that that worldwide thing that kept people at home that I don't want to say because YouTube will, <laughs> you know, suppress things. <laughs> you know, when that happened and when uh, an election event happened and all these different stories were being silenced from one particular point of view, I'm sympathetic. I don't think that should have happened. But when we look at the way that the laws uh, that Texas and Florida would have mandated the government get involved with these companies, you actually open a door to a bigger problem. So the first thing that you can analyze is that the the way that these laws are written, there's, there's a lot of specifics to each of them, but the general gist is that if a particular viewpoint on a topic is allowed you ha- that the the government comes in and says okay twitter facebook any social media site over a specific size um and they had to go back and de- redefine what counts as a social media site which makes it all tricky and sticky but basically large social media sites you have to allow the opposite viewpoint and this can lead to some sort of absurd outcomes right because even as i personally might think that more speech is better and we should allow speech um social media companies don't have uh, an obligation to platform speech that they don't want to. It's their private company. Um, And so the idea that, for instance, Twitter will be a a place where you can say racism is bad and then necessarily has to allow them to allow people to say racism is good. um, You know, the, the problem with that ends up in the specifics of the law, which is Twitter could choose to ban the topic of racism altogether. They don't have to allow people to speak on racism. And so if they're required to allow both sides of a spectrum on particularly, you know, issue on hot button issues that might be more controversial, they're more likely to ban the topic from discussion altogether than allow what they would view as a heinous viewpoint. And so in that way, you actually end up with a lot less free speech because entire segments of conversation and popular discussion will just be disallowed in general. Interesting. And and I agree. It's 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 a it's a double edged sword. You know, the, the, there is there is one place where this gets a little bit gray for me. And I'd like to get your take on this. When social media platforms, just hypothetically, um, if they were if they were to uh, coordinate with government, if they were to respond to pressure, well, we think you should ban this person or we, you should suppress this point of view. Are they shedding that private um, protection as a, you know, as a private property or private company, it, it seems like at that point there, there's a there's a partnership of sorts, and I, I'm wondering how how you would address that. Well, so the the cases that I'm talking about with Florida and Texas, they're regarding two Supreme Court cases um, that was Net Choice v, uh, versus Moody and Paxton v Net Choice, I believe or it could be the orders flipped in there. the 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 case that really would have solved the question you bring up was Missouri v Biden. And unfortunately, I think the Supreme Court actually ruled really poorly on that one, where they they basically made the argument that there was no standing from the plaintiffs. Um, there, there's I, there's a lot more specificity with that case that I've heard better other commentators who've looked into this more speak on. So I would highly recommend anyone who's interested in that look up uh, Tracy Beans. She's done great work on this. But that issue specifically uh, involved what you were talking about, where the government came to uh, Twitter and they said, hey, look at all these people. We want you to ban them. I think initially Twitter said, well, it's not really within our terms of service. And then the government said, well, make it <laughs> within your terms of service, please. And um, and then they shifted it. So I do think that that's a different standard than the government coming in and saying, you have to do this, you have to do that. Um, and so, you know, I don't think the government uh, sort of operating on this communication level with these companies, it's not really a fair playing ground, 
you're not, you know, when, when the government says, you know, we think you should do this, you can, on the one hand, you can say, well, they didn't make us do it, but it's, you know, the, the only quote unquote legitimate monopoly on violence that we have in our society. I, I think there's a little bit more going on than just your neighborhood suggestion. Like it'd be a good idea to change your terms of service. So, so, you know, for people who are worried about that, I completely agree. And I don't think that should be allowed. And unfortunately, I think the Supreme Court ruled wrongly in Missouri v. Biden. Uh, but these net choice cases, um, they also have to do with, you know, managing what a company can and can't do with their own uh, platform. And, you know, one of the things that this also gets involved with is that companies, they uh, – promote and suppress different posts based on what they think a user will want to see. This happens both on the terms of what they think you're going to like on as a user level, but they also do this with advertisements, right? That's why you have certain categories of posts that are not marked as kid appropriate because advertisers are very clear to not want to associate with non-family friendly content a lot of the time. And so the problem is when you are required to treat all speech equally as these laws would have done. Um, it's it also includes promoting or monetizing posts. You have to treat them all equally. So now, you know, as a platform, Facebook and Twitter become a lot worse to advertisers. They become a lot worse to users because they can't algorithmically show you things they think you're going to like more, and they can't algorithmically determine this is not a family friendly post. So we're not going to promote this in the same sponsored paid way. And, you know, as we've seen, particularly in the past few years with, you know, the example I, I put in the article is the uh, Budweiser Dylan Mulvaney campaign. They lost so much money for that association. Uh, advertisers are very jumpy about where their ads are going to be seen. And users have more options than ever on social media. And so when you're, you know, degrading the quality of both of these functions, you actually end up killing the platforms altogether. Again, removing more free speech than allowing because if you you know if you're allowed to say all different viewpoints that's great but it's not that great if no one's there to hear it it seems like the common thread when you get government involved whether we're talking the the texas and florida cases or whether we're, we're talking the the case the supreme court you know punted away is uh, at, at some point when you invite government to the table someone is going to make the observation that's a nice platform you got there be a shame if something were to happen to it right <laughs> There's that implied threat. Absolutely. Well, and, you know, anyone who's uh, done um, advertising or, or general social media um, management or, or posts themselves in the political sphere, uh, they should know this. Because when Congress dragged the tech CEOs before them um, because of all of the scandal of, of, you know, the Russian influence on our elections that <laughs> mysteriously hasn't really been brought up, you know, after no evidence was brought forward of that. But when they dragged all these tech CEOs to Congress, uh, the platforms got notably worse in terms of distribution, in terms of me even as a personal user seeing the kinds of content I want to see because they're so scared of the government pressure. Again, where there was no necessarily, there was no law specifically saying you have to do this or that. But when they dragged them on, they said, you know, boy, don't you think this sort of misinformation problem is a big deal? Uh, the tech CEOs rightfully said, uh, we don't want to get involved, and they ended up degrading their product in order to stay away from the ire of the government. Wow. I mean, on the one hand, there it's so easy to, to become better informed if you're willing to do your own uh, vetting and, and your own digging and your own uh, fact-checking, I guess, for lack of a better way of saying it. On the other hand, there is some pretty solid, you know, industrial strength misinformation out there, but it seems like the responsibility should be on our shoulders rather than you know, some bureaucrat somewhere. Completely right. And, and just again, even, even if you, you know, are, it is a trade-off, but the trade-off we see is just the, the products get worse and then people leave Facebook altogether and maybe they go to a fringier site. So, Boy, that uh, beautifully said, beautifully said. Again, we're talking with Donald Kimball. Uh, Donald, for people who wish to follow you or your work, uh, what's the best place to find you? Where, where can they find yeah. you on social media? Yeah, thanks so much. You can find me on X at uh, Kimball Donald, or you can follow all of my work at KimballDonald.com. Okay, this is a great article, by the way, and, and I hope that to people who are you know, concerned about free speech online would take a look at this. I think you cover an aspect that uh, perhaps is not as well understood, but is really crucial. If, if, you, if you're serious about free speech, this is, this yeah, is a good well, way to look at it. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And this article was written before the court ruled the way they did. Uh, the court did sort of rule in the way that, that I had argued they would. 